Understand not only who we are, but the world we live in, and more importantly, the God behind it all. And so it's good to be with you again. Turn in your outline, in your program you received. You're going to want to take some, some notes this morning. Uh, just honest, honest question. Have you ever gone on vacation and then come back from vacation and felt like, I need a vacation? <laughs> Have you ever been on a vacation and come back from the vacation and felt like that was not a vacation? You ever been there and done that? I think Lori and I, we went to, to San Diego with the kids over, over spring break. And, uh, you know, my wife goes, this did not feel like a vacation. And I'm like, boy, I wish we could move mountains and make another one happen, right? Vacation sometimes doesn't feel like vacation. I mean, if you're constantly connected to the world you're trying to leave behind, there's really no rest, is there? The, the phone's lighting up, text messages, social media alerts, you know, trying to manage things from a distance. Sometimes a vacation doesn't feel like a vacation. And boy, I wish we could get a mulligan on those vacations. Amen? I wish we could get those times away. I mean, rarely do we get those vacations where it feels like a vacation. Rarely do we have those moments where we're able to, to forget about the, the troubles and the distractions, and to fully just be in the moment and, and rest. To have that just frame of mind and that quietness of spirit to say, this feels good. Unfortunately, you know, we live in a world where we, we forget that we're human beings and we're consumed by being human doings. Right? There's this, there's this, Wonderful verse in, in Psalms that says, Be still and know that I am God. But yet that be still is foreign to us. I mean, if we're truly honest, even coming into this morning, right? This, this sacred time that we as a church community get to be together. How many of us felt like we just sprinted in the door, grabbed a seat, and we're just like, oh, Okay, God, I'm ready to worship. But our minds and our hearts are going a million miles per hour. I mean, let's be honest. Anyone there right now? You're, you're, you're good. You're good. No one's going to judge you. But the hurriedness of life, it's going to always be there. But there's something that I want to focus on, not just this morning, but also next week for Easter. Because the message of Easter, which is really the message of, of Christ is this, he offers to us what this world could never offer us. And that is a peace and a hope and a quietness of spirit where you're connected with God and nothing else matters outside of your relationship to him. That's the hope we have. And it's not like Jesus is the, you know, once you come to Jesus and it all's just ready and set and done and taken care of, Coming to Jesus only just starts the journey. You know, I'm not here this morning with you and you're not here with me to say, we got it all figured out, man. But we're here as those who, who claim to love Jesus and yet still find that unsettledness in our hearts and have that, that rest that's promised through Jesus. So it seems so foreign. So I, I'm praying that God this morning and next week brings us a message about not only us in seeking that rest, be reminded of the God who is the author of rest. And that's where we come to in Genesis 2. This morning, look at the first three verses of Genesis 2. And, and what I want you to see is how this is all about God. We're so quick to jump to, well, where, where am I? Where am I in this narrative? Where am I in this story? How do I get this rest? If we are consumed with talking about us and we forget God, you're going to end up in an empty pursuit. See, what Genesis 2 sets up is a God who loves rest and now extends that environment of rest to all people. Genesis 2 verse 1, look at it. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. 
And the seventh day, by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested. Circle that word right there, that, that verse. He rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. I can't tell you how much I've poured over these verses this week and I've consulted commentaries and books to talk about this and how quick the writers, the authors are to go to the rest for us as, as believers in Christ and how few really focus on the fact that this is, a, this is a rest of God. There's no mention of you in that verse. I mean, look at it again. There's no mention of man, woman, humankind, you, me. It's all about God. As a matter of fact, God is mentioned 10 times in those three verses. And the fact that God rested is mentioned four times in these verses. And it is saying to us this morning that there is no magical formula to finding rest because the only answer for rest that we seek after is in a person and his name is God. Amen? Now, I don't know how many of you are watching the, the March Madness basketball games, but the... the, the the very first week of games, there was a college by the name of University Maryland Baltimore County. Now, no one ever knew there existed such a school until the, t the seed 16 beat the seed number one. First time ever in history. Do you know how many brackets were busted first week? 17 million brackets, all of them busted except for 10,000. Week number one. That's amazing. And it is said that the college, just by sheer mention of the name and the, and the Cinderella story of that first week, had earned for themselves about $191 million in advertising, totally free, because people were talking about them. Well, today there's a game on. Texas Tech versus Villanova. Should be a good one. Coach of Texas Tech's an interesting character. He is a coach who believes, he's kind of a quirky guy named Chris Beard, he believes that if you follow certain formulas every single day, his team's going to win. He has a thing called a rebound belt, and he'll award the player with the most rebounds a belt, and it's like a WWF belt, and they'll wear around all week to class and all that. And, and uh, he's got a special mixtape that he plays every day, same song. It's got like Bob Seger and 2 Chains and Nickelback and all sorts of stuff. And if I only play these, these songs, we're going to win. But probably the, the coolest thing about this coach is he's got a pair of socks from, he's got three daughters. He's got a pair of socks that one of his girls bought him. And it's, uh, it's got neon rings on it. And he's worn them 16 days in a row without washing them. And he's won every, I know, you don't want to be in that, that bus with that guy, right? But he really believes like, Dude, these socks are hard as a rock, but I'm not washing them because I've won every single game up to this point. And I wonder how many of us follow magical formulas, thinking like, oh, if I only do this set of things or these set of rules or have these sort of little practices, then you know, I'm going to really get what I want. I'm going to win in life. I'm going to achieve. I'm going to accomplish whatever. And God's got like, you know, he just stops and says, you are, you are better than that. You are designed to have a relationship with me. There's no magic formula. It's relationship. And, and God says to us, be still and know that I am God. Not be still and know that the, the magic's in the formulas you're going to follow day in and day out. The answer is God and it will always be God. Genesis 2. God sets forth for us a pattern that I believe is going to minister to our hearts, but we first have to understand who he is in light of all this. I mean, how many times throughout history have we experienced what Thoreau discussed? The, the, the mass of men lead their lives in quiet desperation. Have you ever been there and felt that? 
How about the old Greek proverb I actually mentioned to a friend this week? You know, if you keep the bow continually bent in your life, it will eventually break. You know, how about Augustine, the great, one of my favorite quotes, you have made us for yourself, God, and we will be restless until we find our rest in you. That's what, that's what God wants. This is why Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's next week. Okay? You know people in your lives. If you want to invite someone to come out for Easter, because Easter's the time you go to church, right? Bite them next week, because it's a message on what does this rest look like for us? Today, what does the rest that is rooted in God look like? Four points in your notes. Chapter 2 opens this incredible account God's created. Six days, days one, two, three, he forms. And day four, five, six, he fills what he forms. Right? He creates the skies and fills them with the moon and the sun and the stars. Day two, he creates the, you know, the, the atmosphere and separates the the sky from the waters and the, brings forth the land. And day, day six, he creates the animals and man. And I mean, incredible stuff that you and I have looked at already. But day seven is interesting. There's no and morning and evening clause involved. Because day seven, I think, has to do with an unending, timeless kind of thing God wants us to understand. There's no mention here of, of God blessing the other six days, but he blesses the seventh day. There's something unique there in the seventh day that we need to understand. He, he sets it apart as unique to the other creation days. Uh, he is mentioned here uh, many, many times. The creation formula and God said is not mentioned here. See, day seven is unique, and God wants us to stop and consider this. So day seven, also known as, here's a good word, Sabbath. Write that word down. Sabbath. And if it helps you to think of black Sabbath, go for it. You know, Iron Man, paranoid, yeah, cool stuff, right? Sabbath. What does Sabbath mean? Sabbath means rest. That's, that's, that's the Hebrew word for rest. Sabbath is an important concept to understand in our spiritual lives, yet I think we largely miss it. And God is reminding us once again how important this rest, this, this Sabbath is. But first we talk about the Sabbath of God. Next week we'll talk about the Sabbath of man. Four things we're going to talk about. Number one, we're going to talk about, I'm going to give you the blanks so as not to miss any. God finished because his work is complete. Number two, God rested because his work is satisfying. Number three, God blessed because his work is spiritually fruitful. And number four, God sanctified because his work is worship focus. And you're welcome. I went easy on you guys this week. I know past few weeks, it's, it's almost like a dissertation in your, in your notes, huh? Well, four points this morning, but let me just tell you, each point is worthy of our attention. First, God finished because his work is complete. What does it say? Verse 1, chapter 2. The heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. And verse 2 says, and by the seventh day, God completed or finished which he had done. I mean, think about this. God sits there and looks and says, it is finished. It is complete. Everything I have set out to do, everything that I wanted to perform out of my will, I have done. And so God finishes his work. He deems it as complete or perfect. And what we need to understand is that now nothing is lacking in what God has created. And you need to write that down. Nothing is lacking in what God has created. Because how fickle are we as human beings 
when we approach God as if he hasn't given us enough? How fickle are we when we consider the work of the hands of God and what he has done and what he's designed and what he's created and we still want more? See, Genesis 2 is God saying to us, I have given you everything. You are lacking nothing. That's a word for us all. It's a word for us all to realize that this, this, this message, this day of number seven that stands alone and is unique, it is emphasized clearly that God has done his work of creating. There is no more creating. Stop and consider that if you would. There is no more creating from God. He's done creating. But that doesn't mean he's uninvolved. Write down three words. Because what you now see in scripture from this moment on is while God does no, he no longer creates, he does three things still. Number one, he sustains. Number two, he nurtures. And number three, he works. I mean, look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 17 on the screen. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Here's what's really cool, is even though God has completed everything, he's finished his creative work, he is still sustaining all that he has created. Now you want to be humble, just think about this. If he stops sustaining, all this comes to nothing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in my lungs. It is your breath that now sustains me. And I'm praying that that breath, just like the song we just sang, is declaring to you, great are you. Because without your breath in my lungs, and I'm not even going to claim them as my lungs, they're really God's lungs, because he could stop my lungs at any moment. Great are you, Lord. He sustains you me and everything. He holds the world in the palm of his hands. There's not an orbit of a, of a planet. There's not the, the dissolvement of a star. There's nothing that takes place in this world that is unknown and not ultimately controlled by the sustaining power of God. That is awesome. But not only does he sustain, but he nurtures. He's a God who's intimately acquainted with the affairs of this world and worlds that are unknown to us. He's a God who is a nurturing God who cares for his creation. I mean, look outside. We, as Arizonans, ought to be the most worshiping of all people. <laughs> right? Here is a God who reigns on the just and the unjust. Here's a God who shows sun to the just and the unjust. There's this common grace that is evident around the world. Some people acknowledge the God behind these graces and some people do not. But he's a nurturing God and he cares. And how much more does he care for those of us who are created in his image? Think about that. While he has finished his work of creating, and you and I are here as a result of his command to the first parents to be fruitful and multiply, amen? He still tells every single person through creation and conscience that he is here and he loves. He nurtures. And so that's an incredible idea to consider. But not only that, he works. Jesus said in, in John 5, 1 Hebrews 1, I think we have this verse up here. Hebrews 1 verse 3, he's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. I mean, think about that. That's an awesome phrase, right? And God exerts no energy other than the fact that the Bible says even just by his word, he upholds all these things. But then he's a God who works. John chapter 5, this is why Jesus said these words, my father is working until now, and I am working. It is cool to know that God is working. That God is ever active in his creation. While he may not be creating anything anymore, he is still involved and working. And the greatest work God is up to, you want to write this down, he is leveraging all things, 
all people, all situations to somehow bring him glory because if it's not about God's glory, all our work is fruitless. Why? Because he's the God who's created all this. He's the designer. He's the architect. And so he says it is finished. His work is complete. And if God didn't care about these things, everything would just dissolve into nothing. But yet he cares. And so we sit there and go, wow. Thank you, God. Second point. But then he rests. God rested because his work is satisfying. His work, work is delightful. His work is joyful to behold. This is, this is the idea of an artist who steps away from the canvas and sits there and looks and goes, it's done. The potter who forms the pottery and puts it in the oven and, you know, at the, at the end goes, it's complete. You ever felt like that when you do yard work and you look out there and go, that's awesome. And yet in your mind, you know, half hour, it's all going to be messed up again. You know, when you clean the house and you're like, oh, this feels so incredible. And you just know the dust is going to start just layering up once again. You know, it's, just, it's, just, it's that momentary satisfaction that you've, you've, you've labored for something you care for. And you're able to step back and, and for a moment look and go, oh, it's satisfying. You know, when you complete a task like that as a human being, your body releases endorphins, and that's why you feel good about it. But God's different. Could you be like God rested, and you're like, does God get fatigued? Does God get weary? Was he like, those snakes, those guys were hard to make, you know? Those manatees, I tell you what, cute creatures, yeah, well, they're, they're hard work. The oceans. I mean, yeah, Canyon Lake's one thing, but the Pacific Ocean, that's another. And God's just like, oh, I'm glad I'm done with all this. I need a break. I mean, you look at it, right? It says in verse 2, And God rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Is God a God who gets weary and worn down and just is like, I am tapping out. I need some me time. <laughs> and yet what, what we have to understand, that word rest is the word Sabbath, which ultimately means to cease from labor. It's this idea of saying no more needs to be done. It is complete. And in no way does this imply that God is worn down or weary or fatigued. This is really the rest of achievement. The rest of completion. This, this idea that I have ceased effort, I have ended activity, and I'm not tired because of it, but I want to step back and I want to delight in it. And if you think about the fact that what God has created, what what we see, and even the things we don't see, he has done these things and he delights in them. To know that God delights in not what he has created, but even in the creation of man and woman, he delights in us. This is an awesome thing to consider because the world will pound us down with the opposite message. You're worthless and you're purposeless and you're insignificant and you're a deadbeat and you're a loser and you name it and... And yet there's a God who through his grace says, I delight in you. I mean, think about those words. People that don't experience the words of loving affirmation from a parent, men and women that I talk to who will tell me that they never heard the words, I love you from their parents. The, the words, I love you, never uttered by a close friend or confidant. And yet there's a message that goes out through all of creation, what God has done, and he says to us, I delight in you. That's a good word. And God rests and takes a step back and says, it is very good. The last verse of Genesis chapter 1, right? God saw all that he had done. And he goes, man, this is very good. 
And now we enter this chapter 2. And why is this important? Because the narrative in Genesis is going to change because now the main actors in the narrative in chapter 2 is God and Adam and Eve. All the writer wants you to be focused on is the relationship that God has with his creation and specifically those who are created in his image. And we know, if you're Bible, biblically literate, you know chapter 3, that whole relationship gets destroyed because of sin. But for at least one chapter, can we have a moment of like, oh, this is beautiful. Right? If you think about it, chapter 2 is God saying, I'm a God who exists to delight in his creation. Not that he needed creation, but he delights in it. It's a reflection of his glory and his power and his honor and his worth. And for some odd reason, he invites you and I into that. This is Genesis 2, right? I am a God who didn't need you, but I, I delight in you and I want to have relationship with you. And this is now the narrative of chapter 2. Something you need to be encouraged by. Isaiah chapter 40. How remarkable the words of this, this chapter are, especially towards the end. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. Amen. His understanding is unsearchable. Amen. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How many of us have heard those words before? Don't forget the context. Genesis 2. You have a God who is omnipotent in his power. And his power comes never to an end. Right? He is a God of unlimited power and never at one moment does his power even move a needle as far as towards faintness or fatigue. He is always ever active and that activity is always perfect and full and he never lacks one moment of powerlessness or tiresomeness. Is that even a word? I don't know. I like it. I'll, I'll play it in Scrabble. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tempt it. God does not need a breather. His creating power is infinite. And I wonder that's, if that's why Jesus offered that message of rest. Because he wants us to know you can never, ever exhaust God's power on your behalf. You ever feel like, I can't go to God with this. I can't trust God with this. God is sitting on, who do you think I am? I'm a God who is always willing and ready and available to minister to the lives of those who love me and don't ever think you're bothering me. Don't ever think like you're taxing me and don't ever think like you're taking too much from me. He is a God who works on our behalf and he does it more than we can ever, ever imagine. Amen? You can call on him for anything. Anytime, any need, you call upon him because his strength is perfect. And just like Isaiah talked about, he is looking forward to being your strength and your weakness. To making you fly when you didn't think you could get off the ground. When you felt so faint and weary, you have a God who is not like that. That's why he is creator in your creation. This is why the sovereign God sits here and declares in Genesis 2 that I rest because I have achieved and I will continue to achieve everything I set out to do. And you can do nothing about it. I'm going to savor my beauty. I'm going to enjoy my accomplishment. I'm going to celebrate completion. And God says, I invite you now into this relationship because with me, God says, you have nothing to worry about. Stop and think about this creation. At this moment, it is untouched by sin. It is unmarred by man and woman's disobedience. Think about this. God must have been incredibly refreshed and delighted in the fact that he is looking out over the created universe that is free from sin, free from decay, free from the curse. There's no death. He saw the pristine blue skies sparkling with diamond stars. He saw the 
brilliant blazing sun out there, when he saw crystal clear waters without any kind of pollution in them, he had a world with no death. He saw these shiny white sands and magnificent colorful flowers, stately trees, birds, fish, animals all over the place. And how much God delighted, not just in those things, but now the ability to walk through the Garden of Eden and fellowship with man and woman where there's no sin, there's no disruption, and what a delight it must have been for God to be a part of that. And not a part, the part. Wow. Now we're starting to understand something about the character of God. And the fact that He is a God who delights what he's created. Number three, God blessed because his work is spiritually fruitful. Look at verse three. And God blessed, circle the word blessed, the seventh day blessing in Genesis has to do with multiplying, be fruitful and multiply. Remember what I talked about when it came to, to, to the animals? He said to them, I'm going to bless the animals, which now gives them the physical ability to be fruitful and multiply, to reproduce. And he gives man and woman the same command. I'm going to bless man and woman now with this ability to reproduce, be fruitful and multiply. Now he says to the seventh day, I'm going to bless this day, which now now implies not physical reproduction, but now there's a spiritual reproduction that happens on the seventh day, that this day spiritually has the ability, because God has deemed it so, to be fruitful and multiply. Now we're on to something. That God has isolated a portion of our lives to experience spiritual reproduction. And how many people go through their daily existence, weekly existence, monthly existence, and they have no clue what spiritual reproduction looks like in their life? There's a reason why the command in Exodus, chapter 20, verse 8, one of the Ten Commandments says this, Keep the Sabbath and make it holy. We have forgotten that God has, excuse the expression, impregnated a certain day of the week for spiritual reproduction to take place in the lives of his people. Now what that looks like is something we get to unpack next week for Easter because Easter is all about reproduction, isn't it? No. Well, yeah and no. Some of you are like, we're done with the sex talk, aren't we? Like... This, this word, blessing, it is full of vitality, it is fu- full of creativity, it is full of fulfillment. And what we need to realize is that there is a day that is fruitful according to God's design of it. And if we miss the fruit bearing that is existent in this day, we will miss out on the blessing of God. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that, you know, oh, you, you know, Saturday is the Sabbath day. And you better keep it holy. Like, we're not going to get all legalistic like that. What I am going to tell you is that there needs to be a day where we stop and we understand the spiritual multiplication and reproduction that needs to happen in that day because God has deemed it so. Now, I will tell you that there are two days we call the weekend and more than lover boy working for the weekend and thinking like, I'm going to party and just have a good time. Like, and my kids love that song. We sing it like to the top of our voices in our car. So uh, long live lover boy. All right, so there are two days that we call the weekend Saturday and Sunday. Here's what you need to understand. Saturday, Saturday is the last day of the week. And Sunday is the first day of the week. Doesn't it make sense biblically that we rest from our work, from our labor, and take that last day of the week and really spend time focusing on what is truly important in the big scheme of things? Unfortunately, we've taken that day and we've used it for ourselves. 
And then we think Sunday's the day now we can focus. Sunday's your first day of the week. And you, you got to appreciate how God like bookends this whole thing. Today is the first day of the week, which is awesome. Monday's not. Despite what your boss may tell you, today's the first day of the week and is the day of the week where you come together and you labor with the people of God called your brothers and sisters in Christ and we once again get spiritual alignment and be reminded as we go into the week what's truly important. Is that cool? We're here for work today. You've reported for duty. You've punched your time card. And God says, thank you for coming out and working and laboring to focus on what is truly important. And what is truly important is your love for God and your love for each other. And that's why we gather. There are no Lone Ranger Christians out there. Amen. You do not exist in isolation. We need each other. Here's the thing. See, the seventh day is a day all about ceasing from labor and delighting in creation. And more importantly, for us as believers, delighting in the Creator. But Sunday is a day of celebration when it comes to redemption. Next week, we get to celebrate the greatest event that ever happened in human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you think it was just by mistake that God made it happen on a Sunday? Do you think God made it by mistake that we as the church are gathered to, together on this day, the day of resurrection? See, yesterday is the day of rest and completion. Today's the day of celebration. Yesterday we celebrate God as creator. Today we celebrate God as redeemer. Now we understand our weekend. Now Monday through Friday take on a whole different form and feel. You are called to work. You're called to labor, but you're never to do those things at the expense of celebrating the day of your creator and celebrating the day of your redeemer. Because here's what's happened. We are trying to experience the multiplication and fruitfulness of what God wants for us out of our labors, and you are never meant to derive your spiritual multiplication and reproduction from your labors. You were designed to get the multiplication and, and, and fruitfulness of spiritual blessing from not your labors, but God's grace. Follow me on this, please. All true blessing comes not from our labors, but from God's grace. And if we forsake His grace, we end up spiritually empty. So if God has designed us to experience spiritual reproduction and he's blessed a certain day of the week to be fruitful and multiply and yet we're not focused on that fruitfulness and that multiplication that comes from his grace, we are going to miss, up, miss out and end up empty every time. This is why God has designed it so. Someone once said that even our secular leisure activities cannot do for us what Sabbath rituals can do. For religious rituals do not exist just to promote togetherness. They are designed to convey to us a certain story. Listen to this. It's about who we are. The story told by the Sabbath is the story of creation. God rested and we rest in order to honor the image of the divine in us. There is now this supernatural activity we recognize that unless I connect with God and delight in Him, you can call it working for the weekend, you're still going to regret Monday morning when you've missed out on Him who is the most important part of your life. This is why there is so much despair. This is why there's so much misery. This is why there's so much frustration because we have not stopped and learned the words of the psalmist, be still and know that I am God. And not only that, Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, verse 7, and deep calls unto deep. That there is a depth of God that you and I will never get to the bottom of, but he still invites us to explore, to live in, to swim in, to drink, to breathe, to eat. And every day there's an invitation to 
have that voice of God, that invitation to explore the depth of who he is because he is bottomless. He is limitless in what he offers as far as satisfaction and delight to the human spirit. Deep calls unto deep. How often does God call us to just have fellowship and relationship with him? See, we live in a world, and this has gone on for centuries, where gods have been memorialized in temples made by human hands, and the temples are visible illustrations of their power over creation or chaos or whatever, and yet God sets apart a day and says, you want to know how I'm going to be memorialized in the hearts of my people? Don't build anything for me. Live in me. Love in me. Exist in me. Have union with me and just be with me. This is truly something that we have so much to learn. This is truly something that, again, great is our God, His breath in our lungs. Deep calls to deep. Creator longs to connect with creation. And if perhaps there's nothing in this world that satisfies you, perhaps that's an indicator that you have been created for another world and another relationship altogether. So God says, this day is infused with procreative power. This day is special and holy and it holds a power for fruitfulness for your existence that you know nothing about. And yet when you get a little taste of it, you go, oh, I, I want more. And God says, come to the fountain and drink and you will find that you will never exhaust the fountain of resourcefulness that God's given to you for your lives. What does that look like? More next week. You like the appetizer? Yeah, it's good, isn't it? God has designed us to find our all in Him. And if we don't stop and take a break and exist in that relationship with Him, we're going to miss out. That's why sometimes even our Sunday time together feels weary. Because you need a time outside of this. You need to be disciplined in your life to say, I'm going to slow down the hurried pace of my life and have a day specially notched out for me to just dwell with my Creator. Amen? Amen? Last point. God sanctified because His work is worship focused. It's everything we've been talking about. The aim of what God has created is to worship Him. And not only has He created the sun and the moon and the mountains and the trees to worship Him, those things do it involuntarily. He has designed us as human beings now to have a choice in doing this. And this is why he deemed this day, he didn't only bless it, but he deemed it holy. The first time God has designated anything holy in the Bible. Day number seven. That's significant. Because holiness is something that is part of God's, it, it's God's character. He is holy. Holy. And now he deems a day, the seventh day, a holy day. And this is the first thing designated in scripture that God sets apart to not only display his holiness, but now to set it apart for himself. He says, this day is for me. It is about me. It is for me. It's all about me. You tell me about a day this past week where it was all about God. You tell me about a day you had this past week where it was set apart for him. Because it had nothing to do with you. But I know how selfish I am. And I know how prideful I am. And I seize every day the moment I wake, how can I leverage everything today to be about me? Anyone guilty of this? We've hijacked what God has set apart for ourselves. And we wonder why we're so, I'm just tired. I'm weary. I'm fatigued. I need a break. God says, because you've missed out on everything I've wired you to be. There's a holy day that God says, it is important. This is why in the Ten Commandments, he says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. He 
we will unpack more of the practical ramifications of this on Easter. And what's fun is, and I didn't script this out, but I'm thinking to myself, for Easter, how many of us, you know, we do a special Easter message? I'm thinking to myself, we don't need to do a special Easter. I mean, every Sunday is a special Easter message, just so you guys know. Next week, it just tends to be, you know, on the calendar, and people celebrate it and sell a lot of chocolate bunnies and stuff like that. But the idea of rest is such an Easter message. And we live in a world that is clamoring for rest. There's a lot of people that are just, their lives are an upheaval. There's disruption. And yet the message of Christ is exactly tied in with Genesis 2 where he says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What does that look like? What does that mean? What are the implications of it? We will discover that next week. But let me stop and just give you a little something real quick. Think about what we just talked about. God finished, he rested, he blessed, and he sanctified. Good Friday, Silent Saturday, Resurrection Sunday. On Friday, what did Christ declare on the cross? It is finished. He rested. How did God rest? Well, Silent Saturday, no activity. Because he accomplished what he needed to accomplish on Friday. He rested in the tomb bodily. Spirit was with God at that moment. And then he blesses. He brings about fruitfulness from his labor. Why? Because on Sunday he rises from the dead. And now he's at work sanctifying those who would believe in his sacrificial death and resurrection. You tell me Genesis 2 isn't connected with, with Easter? God rested on the seventh day. Isn't that good to know that God completes what he sets out to do? And if he's perfect in completing his work in creation, he's also faithful to complete his work that he's begun in us. Think about these things this week. Stop and quiet your heart and really consider perhaps not just the passage we've read, but the passages I've referred to. May they serve as the deep calling unto deep. And then next week, we get to explore what this means for us, practically. Because we get to talk about the Sabbath rest for us as believers. And if you're bringing someone who doesn't know Christ, I pray that God would speak to their hearts. Because they're, they're no different than us, other than they don't know the answer of Jesus, and I pray they get the answer of Jesus. But don't think you're better than them because you have Jesus because you oftentimes in Christ don't know what that rest that Jesus affords looks like and feels like. So the message next week is for all of us where we get to declare, yes, our God has declared it is finished and died and was buried, but he's risen again in order to bless us and impart to us a holiness that we can never derive from ourselves. He is risen. He is risen. Let's stand, let's pray. It is your breath, God, in our lungs that now gives us the ability to cry out to you, great are you, God. You are a God that's not served by human hands. You're a God who has no lack or deficiency in your character. You're a God who doesn't need something from his creation, but yet in you we live and move and have our existence. And for some reason, you have extended a gracious hand to us and have invited us into relationship with you. And that is mind-blowing. That we are set apart from the rest of creation and we now have the ability to have a relationship with you. Father, my prayer is that we will plumb the depths of what that even looks like. That as your spirit works in our lives and invites us into a deeper, more intimate relationship with you, we would be moved in that direction. May the voice that invites us to the deep places be that very thing that compels us to go there. 
that while there may be fear, it is a fear because you, we are to revere you and have you in awe because you are God worthy of these things. So beyond us and oftentimes so indescribable. And yet you're a God who says to us, I delight in you and I want you. Thank you for being our daddy and thank you for loving us in Christ. For giving us hope and joy, that new song in our hearts and on our lips. And Lord, help us to re remember day in and day out, you are the most important part of our existence. Let us walk in these truths. Let us be guided by the Spirit. And every step of the way, may we bring you honor and glory and praise through things said and through things done. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift His face toward you and give His grace and peace forever and ever.